it was around two years ago when we were starting up the Days of Horror podcast over on our website that we came across a story that took place in Accrington in 1867. Now unbeknownst was at the time, we never once thought that that one story would kickstart the channel and the website as into what it is today. We never thought our YouTube channel would evolve from maybe that one story. And that one story, it took off, it was spread, it was shared on forums, Accrington Web and places like that. And we started to get quite a few followers to our website who were listening to our podcast stories. We never once dreamt that that one story would, like I said, take us to where we are this very day. With over a thousand subscribers, like 1,114 subscribers on YouTube. But it is what it is. And like I keep saying, we do thank each and every subscriber on our YouTube channel. But as for the story itself and the podcast that we, we did and we covered on this story, it took place on the 1st of March, 1867, like I said, over in Accrington. And it was one, if not the most tragic and disastrous affair to ever take place over in Accrington. And it involves the death or the deaths of nine innocent little children. When we did the story, we visited several graveyards in and around the Accrington area. Unfortunately, we never found a single headstone, so we couldn't pay our respects the way we wanted to with these little children. All the headstones have either been removed or they've been covered over by years of neglect. And what we'll do throughout this story, we'll put photographs of those graveyards that we visited and you guys will see exactly what we mean by the neglect and the removal of the headstones. For whatever reason, there was one graveyard which we didn't visit at the time and that is here where we are today in Clayton Lee Moors, just outside of Altham and it is the burial ground of St Mary Enfield. For whatever reason, we just didn't visit this one. So we are hoping today we may just be able to find one, if not two headstones of the little children, or two of the children that sadly lost their lives back on the 1st of March, 1867. Now for the purpose of today's story, we are going to be reading some extracts from the podcast itself and the notes that we wrote originally back in 2021. Now, as I said, the story takes place on the 1st of March, 1867. And in 1867, Accrington was facing one of its toughest periods in its history because of the Lancashire cotton famine. And this occurred between 1861 and 1865. Now, it affected the town because a lot of mills and factories did either overproduced the stock and they couldn't sell it, or they purchased far too much in terms of stock itself, you know, the raw materials ready to uh, put into production. But because work wasn't coming in, it left an abundance of, like I said, stock as well as finished articles, which they just couldn't shift. Now, to add on to top of this, obviously, unemployment was extremely high. And Accrington used to be one of the most proper, prosperous, I should say, towns in the northwest of England. Now, on the 1st of March, 1867, there was a young lady who was aged around 24 years of old by the name of Letitia Burscaw. Now, she was a schoolmistress. I think it was for... Her the St Oswald's Catholic School and she used to live at 96 Blackburn Road. Now adjoining Blackburn Road there's Edgar Street and Edgar Street is where she had rented out some premises to teach young school children. Now it was three months when, or I should say after Letitia had moved premises and she hired out some, some space, or a room I should say, in the premises owned by James Duckworth. Now James Duckworth was a 52 year old businessman and he owned some property that was built underneath the arches of the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway. 
um, viaducts over in Accrington. Now, I think James himself and his business had only been operating there since around 1866, so it was relatively young and, you know, like, uh, it was like a, a flourishing business at the time. And he specialised in heeled knitting and varnishing, which basically is a process of making lengths of cord which had an eye through the middle, which would allow like the, I think it's the warp threads of a loom to raise and lower, which allows shuttles to pass through the weft. Sounds very technical, but if you look it up on Wikipedia and on Google, you'll, um, I think you'll, you'll understand what I'm trying to say. And I'll show some diagrams of what heel knitting actually is. premises James had employed six full-time workers I think one was a male I think he was aged around about 50 or 60 and the the other five employees were all females aged between 14 and 18 but he also had a younger lad I think he was called Thomas Oral who used to nip into the business every now and again just to help out but he wasn't like a full-time employee now on the 1st of March 1867 the Tisha Burst had taking all the children into class, which, like I said, it was on the second storey floor of James Duckworth's building. And it was around 11 a.m. that morning when smoke was seen appearing from under the wooden staircase that went from the first, the first floor to the second floor. So straight away, people were panicking. The people who were working down below started to scream and you know basically tell the Tisha to get the school kids and get the children out of the building as quick as they can. Now you have to remember that these were wooden staircases and there was no exit from the second floor so it literally had to be the kids had to run down these wooden staircases and out to safety. Now Letitia herself or Miss Bursko she was a hero no two ways about it she would make her way in and out of the building on at least five separate occasions, each time bringing children out with her. Some of them were reported to be hanging onto her hair and she was literally dragging them out using her head. Others were clinging to her frock. But she, she brought out dozens upon dozens of children. But so as you can imagine, with it being a wooden staircase, or a wooden floor I should say, to, to get up, or wooden steps, up to get up to the second floor, it would become almost impossible because of the thickness of the smoke, the fire that was raging, and obviously the stir, the staircase itself becoming unstable. But without a doubt, if, if it wasn't for her bravery, many more children would have lost their lives that morning. Now, living in one of the terraced houses, which was quite close to the archway and where Duckworth's business was, and obviously the school itself, was a young Lancashire Constabulary officer by the name of Richard Burton. And he obviously heard the screams and he saw what was quickly occurring. Now, he managed to make his way up the wooden staircase, up into the schoolroom, and he would smash the windows from the inside. And this was to, hopefully, he was hoping to dangle the children out of the window and to lower them down to safety. But it was also obviously to get rid of the smoke that was quickly filling the actual room itself because this smoke, not only was it thick, it was black, it was putrid. It was also toxic because of the chemicals that was used in the healed making process. But just like with Letitia and going in and out of the building. It got to the point where 
it was becoming just too dangerous and theory for his own safety he had no option but to actually jump out of one of the top upper floor windows now he would also be shouting for help he wanted other people to come in to bring ladders and put the ladders on the outside so we could get the children out to safety but there was a lot of confusion people didn't really know what to do and you've got to remember that fire and fire regulations back in the 1800s especially the mid to late 1800s i should say again it was pretty basic ladders had to be transported from nearby houses and that's if they had the ladders that's if people actually possessed a, a, a pair of ladders to, in, the, in the first place so it became very very confusing and people were panicking very quickly what happened then is richard himself jumped out of one of the upper floor windows as i was just saying as he then attempted to make his way back in the staircase itself collapsed under the weight of the fire there was no escape for the remaining children that were upstairs and like i said at the very start there were nine innocent little children who unfortunately they would be left abandoned for no fault of anybody's and they all cowered together or the majority of the nine cowered together in the center of the room So this is Egda Street and this is where Letitia Bursko had originally a school where she taught the pupils. Now it's hard to say if it was on this side of the street or it was on this side of the street. It could well be in this old building here, the Empire Picture House. It may have been further up but this is Egda Street here in Accrington. Um, now she rented the actual building from Thompson. I think three months prior to the events that happened obviously in March 1867. Now we know that the yield business it was situated at the gable end of a row of terraced houses and if you look here the terraced houses are some of them are still here to this day. So we think where I'm pointing out in this archway is where the business of Thompson was and where indeed the school were Letitia Bursko taught those young kiddies. That, we think this is where it was located. Now obviously it's all changed over the years. You've got new road network set up. But um, the viaduct, as you can see, it's still here in all its splendor. But directly in front, just here, is where we think the yield business was and the school of Letitia Bursko. Now it's hard for us to even comprehend because obviously so much has changed but to imagine that between these archways here is where the business used to be and where the building itself burnt down killing nine innocent children there were over or there were between 90 and 100 pupils in attendance that friday morning when the fire broke out and nine of them sadly lost their lives and it was here on the same embankment where the children were dragged out from a top window by obviously the rescuers who were fighting in vain against the fire but it is so difficult to imagine what it would be like now because obviously like i said there's so much changed but yeah i mean it's a sad story and again it's something it's a tragedy that should never have happened so from this angle obviously we can see just the heights and the width of this archway and indeed the gable end of the terraced houses it was just at the top of this street on blackburn road where obviously letitia lived with her parents pete and sarah as well as her brothers and sisters so it was literally a not even a five minute walk each day from blackburn road which is at the top down edgar street and to where she worked
Now, as you can imagine, as the fire took hold of the remaining pieces of timber, the screams of those petrified young little children would eventually fall silent. And outside, a large crowd had assembled with women and obviously the other school children who were rescued. They were all crying hysterically. Now, as all this was happening, you had the press reporters who had made their way to the scene. And they were describing in detail, if you read some of the articles in the old newspapers, they were describing in detail the horrific scenes that they were witnessing. Like I said, you had the children who were rescued outside in tears. You had the parents of those, those children also hysterical. You also had the parents of those kiddies that were trapped upstairs just obviously helpless they couldn't do anything to save their children now it would take just over an hour for the flames to die down just enough for richard burton and another man this time named james crossley to enter the second floor now what burton and crossley encountered like i said would stay with them for the rest of their lives it was unimaginable what they were going to encounter there as i said uh, before the um the nine children themselves, they were huddled together, they were found huddled together in the centre of the room. They were blackened from the fire and the smoke. Many of the limbs on many of the children were contorted in all kinds of positions. It was reported that some of the children's features, the facial features, the hands, the arms, were so burnt that even by trying to lift the bodies from the floor so they could take them downstairs, some of the limbs would literally just disintegrate into powder, into fine powder. The bodies were so badly destroyed. There was no clothing. All the clothing had been burnt off or singed to the bodies. So making identification was very very difficult and we have to remember again that we're talking 1800s there was no dna there was no there was no fingerprints in, and even if there was like i said the hands were so badly disfigured and badly burnt that even the skin had come away it was also reported that on one of the children half of the skull itself had just gone the fire was that intense it was raging for that long these poor little souls had no chance. And we can only, well, we can't, I mean, it's difficult, but one can only imagine the fear that these little kiddies must have felt in those last few moments of their life, screaming and wanted their parents, their mothers, their fathers to come and rescue them. And they, they, they were all huddled together in the center of the room, just, trying to give each other comfort in those last dying moments and um, when i read this story when i when i read that for the first time it, it was really upsetting because these are little children ages were ranging from three i think to nine so they weren't teenagers they weren't adults these were just little children who had done no harm to anybody who were still learning they were growing up and like I said, we can only imagine the fear that they were going through at the time. But it's just the fact, and it, it's, I don't know what it is, but it, I, I, I don't know if it's the way it's worded, that they were huddled together in the centre of the room. That makes it as well, I mean, I know it's upsetting, and it may be upsetting for you guys, but just to read that alone, it really does hit home just how tragic this, this incident was. Now, as the bodies were being brought out, they were all individually wrapped in a sheet and placed onto a cart before being brought to the Crown Inn public house, which was only situated a matter of yards away from where all this took place. And an inquest was opened on Saturday the 2nd of March, just the day after, when all of the victims' names will be released along with an overview as to the events that occurred the day the tragedy took place. 
Now those that sadly died that morning, and I'll read out the names and the ages now, but there was Ellen Ann Voiley, who was aged five, Mary Hannah Fisher, who was aged just three, Elizabeth Jane Wade, who was aged six years, Catherine Lante, who was aged six, Robert Loud, who was aged four, Elizabeth Proctor, who was aged six, Thomas Jackson, who was aged three and a half years, and finally you had Mary Ann Bentley, who was also aged three. Now, you could argue, and well, not argue, but you could say in an unfortunate twist of fate, Mary Alice Duckworth, who was aged six years, and she was amongst the nine young victims, she was also the daughter of James Duckworth, the owner of the building who was in the business of healed making. Now on the 11th of March, a second inquest took place because it was on the 2nd of March that the first inquest, which took place in the Crowning pub, that all that did was basically identify the names of the victims and the, obviously the, the nine people who was found dead in that building that on that morning but on the 11th of march the second inquest took place and it was a very quick inquest three or four people came forward to testify as to what happened that morning but ultimately james duckworth nothing happened as in regards of criminal responsibility or criminal neglect or any fines issued it was literally given a slapped wrist and told he must improve the way his processes of heel making were done and to make sure that obviously the chemicals were safely stored and left away from heat now the investigation and the as i said the inquest itself would it would uncover the fact that these heels these these threads that were being made were dipped in some form of chemical but if this chemical had reached a certain temperature then all it took was the slightest spark and the whole lot would go up so easily but these heels were placed directly under the actual staircase if you will that led from the first floor to the second floor where these children were being taught and they were placed over some pipes some warm heater pipes but these pipes had gotten to such a temperature it set off a reaction which the heels then ignited and these heels that were under the wooden staircase as you can imagine went up so quickly it would set fire to the actual wooden staircase and smoke would be seen coming through and this is how obviously panic started the employees of Duckworth themselves raised the alarm they got out um, Letitia Burstco herself would keep going in and out of the building to get the school children out but there were no other ways in or out of that building other than down the stairs but like I said there was just recommendations of what not to do in the future and what they should be doing. So like I said, not putting the heels, especially on the staircases, which were flammable. Um, it's common sense to us nowadays, but back in the day, you know, space was at a premium. Finances were very tight, I suppose, like they are today. So people were cutting corners. And I suppose in a new fledgling business, such as Duckworth, who'd only been in operation since 1866, you could say it was still finding its way. Still no excuse, obviously there was a lot of neglect, a lot of things should have been done a lot better than they were. But ultimately on this, or in this case, this story, the neglect and the, the way things were done back in the 1800s, it sadly left nine innocent people all alone in a room, hoping that their parents would come and rescue them. That hope soon, soon faded away because like I said, there was just no way for people to get into that building and up that second story floor, if you will, up through the steps easily. The fire itself had taken hold so quickly. It must have been absolutely frightening and horrendous.
Now, while I've been telling this tale, Vicky herself has been looking for the headstone and the final resting place of two children who are somewhere in this graveyard. And that is Catherine Lanty and Robert Loud. This is the one graveyard we didn't visit back in 2021. Um, now we have arrived here not really expecting too much to be quite honest and just like the other graveyards much of the history has gone and much of you know the story of Accrington itself and the fire that took place in 1867 has sadly disappeared as well but it's a, it's a sad state of affairs and it's a shame that nine innocent children lost their lives from no fault of their own due to neglect, due to health and safety, or lack of health and safety, and yet all their bodies have been interred in places such as this, at St Mary's Enfield in Clayton Lee Moors, and yet it's just like they never existed. It's like they were never here, and that their story now, you know, obviously we're, we're retelling it, we're trying to keep their names alive, but for the best part, it's like they never existed, simply because I think it's been that long ago, 1867. They could well be here. The headstones have, have vanished. They've gone for whatever reason. But it's a shame that not a single headstone can be found of these nine little children. Now, during the inquest, obviously they were asked how these heels could have caught fire. And Duckworth himself would say that on many occasions that the heels themselves were they were hung up over these pipes these heaters on a hook and it could have been the children running up and down the stairs throughout that morning which had dislodged and disturbed just one of the heels maybe and it had fallen off the hook onto the pipe which then obviously overheated and it exploded into like a ball of flame if you will which then led to all the other heels themselves catching fire plausible theory nobody will ever know because, like I said, it was Thomas Sorrell who did state that some of the heels were sometimes placed over the warm pipes just so they dry quicker. And other witnesses would say that the heels were hung up on these hooks. But I suppose that's irrelevant in the grander scheme of things. The fact is, these heels were placed close to or on these warm pipes. And obviously they combusted, they hit their, their temperature, their peak temperature and combusted and obviously it led to the tragic events of the 1st of March 1867. Nine innocent people losing their lives. But it's a shocking tale. Um, it's one that said we covered back in 2021. And if you visit our website at www.daysofhorror.com and I'll put a link down below to that article and you can listen to the podcast and you'll see photographs and you'll hear a lot more about it. It's in more detail than what I've done in this video. But yeah, please click that link and make your way over to our website. Now, if you enjoyed this story, guys, please don't forget to comment. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to share this video. Sharing it helps us out immensely, and we do appreciate when people do link our stories and our videos to other platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and whatever. We do really appreciate it. Now, in the meantime, guys, if you did like this story, do all those things. We are going to leave it here from St Mary's Henfield here in Clayton Lee Moors. We're going to go out and record another story this afternoon. We're off, it's Easter. We've got a full, I think, 10 days off, off work now. So plenty of time to get out and film some more videos. But as I always say, guys, take care, look after yourselves, and we will be back soon with another tale from our dark but glorious past. Take care, guys. <laughs>